Hello, friends. Tonight's guest is none other than Miss Mary Morstan herself, the incomparable Jenny Seagrove. We chatted with Jenny backstage at the Theater Royal Windsor late last year in the middle of her run as Gaev in Chekhov's The Cherry Orchard, where she played opposite Ian McKellen. We discussed her time on the sign of four, her fondness for Jeremy, Edward, and the Granada team, and she even shared a tale or two about her time with another Mr. Holmes, the legendary Christopher Lee. Jenny is currently hard at work on Oscar Wilde's The Importance of Being Earnest, a live radio play rendition which runs from April 12th to 16th at the Theatre Royal Windsor outside London. As always, a very special thanks to our producer, David Ewell, for helping to make this conversation a reality. And so, without further ado, we give you Jenny Seagrove. Jenny, it is wonderful to speak with you today. Thank you so much for doing this. My pleasure. We always like to start at the beginning. So when did you first decide that acting was your passion? When were you bitten by that bug, so to speak? Well, when I was at school, many, many years ago, <laughs> um, I, went, I, I grew up in Malaysia and I did ballet. And then I was sent to boarding school when I was nine. And the headmistress of the, the little boarding school I went to in England introduced me to verse speaking in public. And I loved it. And she inspired me. And I remember writing and directing and starring in, of course, my own plays. Mm. <laughs> and then I went on to my public school. Now, that would be a, a what a, it's a high school, I think, in, in your language. Yeah. And again, I starred in all the, the house plays and the school plays. And I knew I was good at it, but I never thought I'd be an actress. In fact, I was studying to be a vet because my passion in life is animals. And I took all the right A-levels, biology, chemistry, and physics, and I got them. And I, I left school and I thought, I would be the world's worst vet because I can't put animals down. I can't do it. Mm. And I thought, oh, my God, what do, I, what do I do? I want to be an actress. And it was mm. at that point, and I told my mother, who was over from the Far East, and I remember her going white and going, but darling, you've always wanted to be a vet. And I went, I know, but I want to be an actress. She said, well, if you're going to do that, you need to get some kind of security, like a cookery course or a secretarial course. And I said, okay, whatever, but I'm never going to use it. <laughs> and then I did a three-month cookery course at Mrs. Russell's three-star school of cookery in London. Whilst I was auditioning for drama schools, I didn't want to go to RADA. I wanted to go to the Bristol Old Vic. I got into Lambda and Webber Douglas, but I was on the shortlist for Bristol. And I really wanted to go there. Mm. So I waited and waited, and the others started putting pressure on me. So I rang them up. And this voice, aren't yes. And I said, oh, um, he hello, um, I I'm on the shortlist. It's Jenny Seagrove. Um, I just need to know if you're going to offer me a place or not, because if you're not, I need to accept somewhere else. And there was this infinitely long pause. <laughs> and the voice said, Yes, I think we can offer you a place here. <laughs> and it turns out it was the principal, Nat Brenner who ended up being a total inspiration for me. Oh. And at the end, when I was leaving, he said, oh, I always knew you'd be all right. Porcelain doll, porcelain doll. <laughs> and <laughs> there we are. I left and I never looked back. And again, indeed, I was lucky getting my first job because in those days, because I'm so ancient, um, we had to get equity cards and there was only a certain allocation given right. so that numbers of people joining the business didn't go mad, unlike nowadays where anyone can do it. <laughs> and so we all wrote our letters to various theatres and my dance teacher a wonderful woman called Lynn Britt quite liked me. So she said, Jenny, make sure you speak to Brian Carter at the Adeline Jenny Theatre because he's a friend of mine and I'll put in a good word for you. So, of course, I forgot. Mm. And it got nearer to leaving and she said, Jenny, did you write to Brian? I went, oh, Lynn, I'm so stupid, I forgot. And she said, oh, don't worry, endless patience, this woman. She said, he's coming, I'll make sure you get an audition. So I auditioned and I got my equity card and off I went to the Adeline Jenny Theatre where I played Jan in Bedroom Farce and the maid in An Inspector Calls. And during that time, I was then asked to go up to Newcastle to do Paris's Page and Lady Montague mm. in Romeo and Juliet and pl to play a frisky stoat in Toad of Toad Hall. <laughs> so they let me off my contract and off I went up there. 
And then I started doing films and, and really never looked back. The rest is history, as they say. Well, this character, Mary Morstan, it's quite a significant one in the world of Sherlock Holmes. And, and I imagine they were trying to be quite specific in the casting of it. Do, do you recall the audition process or was there one or were you just were you just cast flat out? I believe I was cast flat out, thank God. Yeah. Um, mm. And I remember reading it and thinking, oh, no, not another nice person to play. You know, <laughs> when you're kind of an English Rose character, as I was always cast. Actually, I've been cast with some really interesting roles in other films. But in the main, the characters, when I was younger, I was cast as English Roses. And they all tend to be terribly nice and terribly polite. And you look at them and your heart sinks and you think, how can I make this interesting? Yeah. Because nice is not interesting. How do I give somebody this nice a bit of edge? Sure. And that was my overriding thing, not to betray Mary Morstan or the way she was written, because it was referenced how nice she was, but to give her just a little bit of edge. And I think it does come across in, in that she's quite determined with Sherlock Holmes and Watson to have her father's justice made clear, as it were. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, and we've always been curious behind the scenes, off camera, was there much talk of the underlying relationship between your character and Watson's? Because e even though it wasn't shown on the screen in the story, they become married, they're together for a very long time. W was this something that the director wanted you to allude to? Or did you guys as actors choose to acknowledge it? Because it seems like it, there's something very subtly there. But, but how did you decide to play that? It's in the script. Yeah. And it will have been discussed. It will have been acknowledged. And we will, um, me and Ted, have both played it in amongst all the rest of it. Because you're playing not just the plot, you're playing a person. And playing a person means you play all the intentions and the attitudes as well, which is what makes it rounded and interesting. Well, so when you are cast in a part like this one, you know, something that's either a historical piece or a well-known piece of literature... What is your process like? Do you, do you like to read the story or, or do you just stick straight to the script? What, what's your preferred method? It depends. Um, it's pretty much the same. I always go back to the script to see what clues there are. If there's a book, I will read the book because there's always some detail in the book that isn't in the script. And it gives you just an, it stimulates your imagination. You can sort of put it into your performance. And I always have a look at photographs from the time and read up about the period so that you know the mores and the behaviors and the etiquettes and things like that. Yeah. Um, so that you feel, I, I like to inhabit the people I play. I like to know what they feel like so that I believe what I'm saying as that person. A and I believe therefore, because the, I don't think the camera will lie. I, I think the camera always knows if an actor's lying. And so if you speak as that person, when you're immersed in the person, then I believe it's, it's believable and the audience believes it. Yeah. You mentioned uh, Ted Hardwick. Oh, he was lovely. What can you tell us about him? How was he to work with? Had you worked with him before? No, I hadn't worked with any of them before. He was lovely. He was kind. He was funny. You know, Jeremy was much more... Uh, Jeremy was funny, but he was much... There was an edge to Jeremy. There was a sort of... A bit of what you see on screen, whereas Ted was very grounded and very warm. And I love both of them. You know, it's interesting. We, we've heard so many stories about how Jeremy Brett treated this production as kind of his company. And, uh, you know, everyone was family and he was very kind to especially, you know, the, the lead guest stars that would come on. And mm. I mean, do you recall your very first meeting with him when you came on to set for the first time? I remember somebody being very, very kind to me. And that person was Jeremy. Absolutely. He made us feel very welcome. I met him after I'd done... Um, the sign of four. Funnily enough, I was in Los Angeles staying at the Beverly Hills Hotel, and so was he. And there's a swimming pool there, as all these lovely hotels in Beverly Hills have. And I heard this voice, Jenny, Jenny. And I looked over and there was Jeremy on a sun lounger. <laughs> and I said, oh, Jeremy, how lovely to see you. Come and sit down with me, darling. And he gave me career advice. <laughs> he told me I should play in Tennessee Williams' Summer and Smoke. Wow. And bless him, I never had the chance but I've never forgotten that kindness. I loved him. But I, I do remember Jeremy being very, very welcoming and very kind. Was there much um, trepidation in playing Mary Morrison? Oh, yes. With that, with that cast? Absolutely. <laughs> oh, terrified. Well, I mean the character as well, you know what I mean? Well, 
you, I'm always frightened. Every time I do a new person, I think, oh, they're going to find out I can't do it. And that's such a cliche. <laughs> the actors always say, but it is the truth. You know, you get rave reviews for the performance you're doing and then you get sent something else and you think, oh, I don't know if I can do this. Yeah. And my other half is a producer and every time I'm in rehearsal for something or just about to film something, I go, oh, babe, I can't do this, I'm awful. And he goes, babe, you said that last time. And I went, did I? <laughs> and he says, you say it every time. <laughs> and I have to be reminded of that because it's, it's agony. Every time you do a new part, you think, I can't do it. Yeah, but well, it keeps you fresh and, you know, you don't get too comfortable. Well, it keeps you fearful and, and fear is a great motivator to work harder, to, to try harder, to learn more, to dig deeper and to do all the things that you need to do as an actor. Definitely. I can only imagine what it must have been like to see two titans like Jeremy and Thaw, you know, working off each other. You know, and, oh, it was and, great. And, and I had that in another, um, I mean, I'm going off piste a bit here. I did... An English BBC television series when I was even younger than Mary Morstan um, called The Woman in White. And I remember very well uh, the read through of the first episode. And we had Ian Richardson and Alan Bedell. Hmm. And it was like watching The White Knight and The Red Knight in Alice in Wonderland <laughs> joust. And at drama school, we'd been told to always underplay at read-throughs, just mumble, because mm -hmm. you don't know what you're going to and don't commit to anything. Well, these two wonderful actors just went for it. And I remember thinking, my goodness me, this is amazing. Yeah. And, you know, <laughs> Jeremy was amazing. And yes, John Thor and Ronnie Lacey, I mean, just titans. I imagine there must have been a lot of smoke on set, too, because I think at that point, Mr. Thaw was smoking 60 cigarettes a day. Jeremy was a heavy smoker. And the hookah. <laughs> and then there's the DLP. Yes. The lighting people who love to throw in a bit of smoke as well. So Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's good for the light, you know. It's very good. It's very nice and hazy and good for the mood. <laughs> yes. We've also heard some fairly uh, wild stories about offset pub visits and rap parties of the Granada team. Did you did you get to experience any of that? Do you recall a rap party or any fun uh, outside the set experiences? I'm not very good at that because I would have gone up there, taken it terribly seriously because I was young and rather sort of shy, mm -hmm. and then gone home because, you know, I wanted to get home to London. So I would have stayed in the hotel and I probably won't have gone to anyone after set because I will have known I was getting up early and Sure. I wasn't a, a carouser. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, you got to work with the enigmatic Peter Hammond, the director on this yes. one. Yes. He, he actually did quite a few episodes of this show. I think this was the second Sherlock Holmes thing he did. Yeah. What can you tell us about his directing style? You know, what set him apart from other directors you work with? My dim and distant memory reminds me that he was quiet and very careful in what he chose to do. He, having cast you, he tended to choose to trust you, mm -hmm. which is what most good directors do. And there was just the odd note of guidance of, what about this thought in the performance? Mm. And you do a take and he'd just say, just factor this in. Very subtle. Yeah. And he'd then trust you to do it. He was a very light-handed director, which for my money is, is favorite, because he trusted the actors. Yeah. My fear is always when on screen of not being believable and I always want to be real and uh, I'd want someone to say to me, Jen, that's a bit over the top. And I, I don't think anyone's ever said it, but, you know, just in case, <laughs> yeah. I want someone to be able to say it to me. And he would certainly have been someone who would have gone, just bring it back a bit, you know. Yeah. When was the last time you watched this episode, The Sign of Horror? Have you seen it since, since back then? Um, I watched it a week ago because I couldn't remember that much about it. How does it hold up for you? Actually, it holds up really well. I look like, I look and feel like a different person. I think, oh, who's that? Oh, it's me. Oh, okay. Yeah. But, you know, one goes through so many incarnations as a human being, never mind as an actor. And as you were then, you look back on you and you go, gosh, was I really that person? And who am I now? It, it's sort of weird. <laughs> um, and then you go back into your life as you were living then and, and you look back on it and... But no, I wanted to remind myself of the film, and it, it did. It, it held up very well. And I liked the production values. They were really classy. There's a lot of animals in this 
episode too as well. Yes. I mean the very first scene of you they they released some doves. <laughs> I think. Yes. And uh, you got Toby the dog and then the, there's a bear in the scene which I wondered if you had any moments with. No, I had no moments with the bear. <laughs> Sadly because I love animals. I've actually shot a film with William Friedkin with wolves. But again, I wasn't allowed close contact with the wolves. I lay on the branch of a tree and the wolves were underneath it and I was told not to go down. <laughs> <laughs> but I did meet a wolf in rehearsal. It was allowed to sniff me. No, I'm, I, my passion is animals, as I've said. You can actually kind of see it in, in this episode because, you, you know, you approach this horse that's pulling the carriage and you stop and tell it hello and you pet its nose and then you get in the carriage. Well observed. Very well <laughs> observed. But I also think I would have put that in because I believe that Mary Morstan is a very compassionate woman. Yeah. And that won't have been just me. It will have been Mary as well. Jeremy appears to be 100% at the top of his game and healthy in this episode. But this was the first film that they made shortly after, I guess what you might call, he, he had something of a breakdown, which was, you know, in the papers and, and very badly publicized. And, and he never forgave the press for that. But did you ever notice any indication of any kind of health troubles or anything like that with him when you were on set? No, not at all. Yeah. And nor when I met him in Beverly Hills, he seemed just Jeremy. Yeah. You know, there was a neurosis in the man. You could sense a neurosis, but he was just wonderful. And, and he led the set, yeah. you know, as the leading player, he led the set. He was wonderful. I didn't sense anything. And I was really shocked when I looking back, remembered that. Yeah. And even more shocked when finally he died. It was like, what? Yeah. Jeremy's gone because it seemed untimely. Yeah. Was there ever any discussion about bringing Mary back later in the series, bringing your character back? I think there's always discussion about that, but they never did. Yeah. You know, much to my chagrin. Yes, you get signed up for another two or three films in these things, and then it never happened. Interesting. Well, in some of these episodes where they would handle antiques or special props, they would actually get these props from museums or things like that. And I was just curious if those pearls that you handled, do you happen to know if those were real? I don't remember. <laughs> I don't think they were. But I okay. wouldn't like to swear to it. <laughs> Do you know, I could lie to you. Yeah. I could go, yes, they were from, you know, X, Y, and Z Museum or some famous private collection, but <laughs> I'm not going to lie to you. I yes. have absolutely <laughs> yeah. no recall. I could have sat here and made up a lot of stories for you and been an awful lot more interesting. No, we, we appreciate you keeping the record clean. Yeah. Well, somebody else might come on and go, I don't know what that actress is talking about. My memory is this, and then you'd have been in a quandary, wouldn't sure. you? True enough. Well, we spoke to you first, though, so... <laughs> oh, well, then everything I say is obviously true. That's right. If I'm not mistaken, The Sign of Horror was released at Christmas in 1987. Do you recall the uh, Yule time response to the program? I do. I remember it being the Christmas release and everybody being terribly excited about it and, and people ring me up, Jenny, Jenny, you're on the telly. Mm -hmm. You know, oh, it's wonderful. Oh, I'm loving it. All of that nonsense <laughs> going on, you know. <laughs> And as an actor, you have to keep your head small. I must tell you a story. It's, it's a kind of a sign from the universe, I think I took it as. When I was a very young actress, my first ever television was a thing called The Brack Report. And it was a 12-part episode for Thames Television starring Donald Sumter. I had no idea what I was doing. Nobody told us about continuity. But anyway, moving on from that, we'd made it. Mm -hmm. And it was about to come out on television in the UK and I'd just done my first press interview and I was getting frightfully big-headed and overexcited about it all. And I had no money at the time and I was in my then boyfriend's apartment and he said, well, let's have a cup of tea and watch it. So I grabbed the kettle and pulled the kettle out of the socket without turning it off at the mains and got stuck to it because we didn't have enough money and it was a raggedy old kettle and I was about to die of being electrocuted mm -hmm. and I couldn't move. And all I can remember thinking was, I'm too young to die. And through gritted teeth, because I literally couldn't move, I said, turn me off at the mains. Because I knew if he touched me, he'd get stuck too. So he turned me off. And I thought, right, Jen, that's a lesson from the Almighty up there. Never, ever, ever get pig-headed about fame, because it is meaningless. Mm -hmm. Never, ever take yourself too seriously, because at the stroke of whatever you can go. It's all gone. Yeah. Life, fame, everything, it's gone. So just enjoy the moment and move on. 
Yeah. So, you know, the whole thing, I'll come back to Mary Morstan and, and Sherlock Holmes being at Christmas. Yeah, it was lovely. But when people ring you up and go, oh, you're on the telly at Christmas. It's lovely, but so what? Yeah. Do you know what I mean? I love <laughs> that people love the picture. And I still get people now asking for photographs from that period and, and saying, oh, they loved it and it was their favourite. That's wonderful because we've given them an hour and a half of joy. But I'm not going to change who I am because of that. And I think it's terribly important to stay grounded. Yeah. Well, definitely make sure your kettle is always properly grounded at the very least. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> It's good to say grounded, but it's also healthy to, uh, you know, take some of that in because, I mean, you, you've created a lot of joy for a lot of people. Oh, it is. It's lovely. It's lovely. I mean, I, I played the lead in A Woman of Substance, which changed a lot of people's lives in the 80s. Yeah. People used to come up to me and go, on, I've started this business and it's thanks to you. You've inspired me. And, you know, I'm just an interpreter. It's actually Barbara Taylor Bradford who became a good friend. And my mission was to play Emma Hart. And I did, and it was successful. And between us, we inspired a whole generation of women to have the courage to start their own businesses and, and to believe in themselves. And I'm really proud of that. Yeah, I, I've done so many plays where you hear the laughter rolling off the audience. And it's just a joy to know that for an hour and a half, people are transported into another world. And you can give them that. I do believe that without theatre and without film and television, there'd be a lot more people in hospital. Mm -hmm. I really do with, with mental health issues. I think it is such an important aspect of our lives that is being so overlooked these days. Certainly in England, you know, our education programmes are now cutting the arts out of what they teach children. Mm. And it's like, why are you doing that? It's so important. You can't just teach them English and maths and the sciences. Yeah. The arts, they're what keep us sane. They're what keep us human. And as you say, it's a perspective on other people's lives. Not only modern lives, you see how other people live, but also past lives, which give you a, a, a depth of history and you, you see how much people have moved on. I mean, we had, when I was young, a series called Upstairs, Downstairs, incredibly famous series. I watch it now and I squirm at how the women were treated yeah. because they were given no voice. You know, and, and thankfully now most women are, are at last finally being given a voice. But it's so important now to value what we have now by looking at what we didn't have then. And I think sometimes people nowadays forget what fights there have been to achieve what we've got now. They take it for granted, and I think that's a shame. Well, and that brings us back to Jeremy, who, you know, was frankly something of a pioneer with regards to his bipolar disorder, just in how open and honest he was about his condition. Absolutely, he was. And, and I remember being quite shocked when I heard about it, but also celebrating the fact that he had the courage to talk about it. Yeah. Exactly what you say. He was incredibly pioneering because people didn't talk about mental health. Yeah. It was taboo. And now it's everywhere. People still feel ashamed, but at least there are places you can go to talk about it and, and get help. Yeah. Well, before we let you go, you also had the distinction of playing opposite yet another Sherlock Holmes. Christopher Lee. Christopher Lee, yeah. <laughs> Incident at Victoria Falls. Can you tell us a little bit about that film? How did that one come to you? And uh, how was Christopher? That was a, a completely different experience. We went out to Zimbabwe mm. to shoot it. And it wasn't, as you know, because you're Sherlock Holmes aficionados, um, written by... Conan Doyle. Conan Doyle, thank you very much. It was an imagination. And it was for an American company, Harmony Gold. But it was a good story. And I played Lily Langtry, which was a lot more fun to play than Mary Morstan because she's got a bit more edge to her. Sure. However, I was still terrified <laughs> because I was working with another titan. Mm -hmm. And... Chris Lee, I made, I became very close with Chris, but Chris loved to talk. And I very, very clearly remember I had a, a scene where I had a lot of chit chat at a table in a restaurant and we were sitting and Chris was talking before the take and he was talking, he was telling stories. And all I wanted to do was sit quietly and focus on my lines because I was terrified I was going to not come up with them. And he was talking right up to action. And of course, I'm terribly polite, so I was talking back to him. And I didn't have the gall to say, 
uh, Christopher, would you mind awfully shutting up? You know, I need to focus. No, no, no. Little Jenny, young actress, was like, oh, yes, of course. Yes, oh, how funny. And laughing at all his jokes. Mm -hmm. um, but I did love him. I loved him and his wife as well. Yeah. Loved them both. And I think he was a lifelong Holmes fan, so I assume he was pretty happy to be playing the part. He was very happy to be playing it. Yeah. Very, very. He loved playing that part. That's really great. Well, you also mentioned The Cherry Orchard. Can you tell us a little bit about the current project and uh, how, how it's going? Well, it actually is part of a two-play season. We're doing it at Windsor, uh, just outside of London, and Bill Kenwright's produced it. And he collaborated with Sean Mathias, the director, and Sir Ian McKellen. And he asked Sean to be the artistic director at Windsor for this period, only it was meant to open in 2020. But we all know what happened in March 2020. Sure. And so it all got delayed. And then in the summer of 2020, we started rehearsing for Hamlet with Sir Ian McKellen playing Hamlet at the age of 81. And you playing his mother. And me playing his mother, <laughs> yes. And that went on for two weeks and then we got locked down again. And then we started rehearsing again. We actually made a film of it in March 2021, the beginning of this year. Yes. Because we wanted to keep the company together. And Sean said to Bill, oh, I'd love to make, make a feature film of it. So we shot a feature film with the Theatre Royal Windsor as Elsinore with the entire cast. And that's now being edited. Then we went into rehearsal for Hamlet. And once we'd opened Hamlet and played it for a few weeks, we then started rehearsing The Cherry Orchard. And I played Gertrude, who's Hamlet's mother in Hamlet, and I'm now playing Gaev, which, if anyone knows their Chekhov, is uh, Ranyevskaya's brother. <laughs> so this production is very much full of age-blind, gender-blind, colour-blind. We've got people of colour, we've got women playing men, and it's just joyous. Yeah. We've just got two fingers up to everybody who goes, you've got to be this to play this. You know, yeah. Ian and Sean and myself and I think all the other actors just go, you're an actor. An actor can play anything. Yeah. You know, you don't have to be a murderer to play in the Scottish play. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Yeah. All this nonsense about you have to be, uh, I mean, I'll be controversial. They say, oh, well, you have to be gay to play a gay person. No, you don't. In that logic, you should never allow gay men to play straight. Right. If you follow the logic through... You're never stretching yourself at, th at that point. No. And listen, I understand. Certain minorities have been excluded from things. And it's absolutely right that they are not overlooked and that they are chosen. But don't exclude others. It should all be about talent and the right mix for the piece. It shouldn't be about you have to only choose from a certain pool because of what their gender is or what their colour is or how tall they are or, you know, whether they've got two crossed eyes. You know, it, it's all wrong. Actors are actors. We're creatives. Yeah, and it sounds like, frankly, a lot of fun. It's massive fun. Yeah. And it helps that it's been incredibly well-reviewed. Yes. <laughs> and I believe we got a wonderful review from the New York Times just recently, Yeah, which is very exciting. I don't read reviews, but somebody told me about it, and I was thrilled. That's great. Well... Jenny, we certainly put you into a time machine today, and, and we appreciate your willingness to travel back to the 80s with us to talk about this incredible show. So <laughs> thank you so much for doing this. My great pleasure. Lovely to talk to you. Thank you so much. Ta-ra. <laughs> 